So I tell all my students that I work with, you have to print the instructions. Even if this teacher did not make it quite so easy, you know, it's not a PDF. Maybe it's just literally text inside of a Google Classroom or something. Mm -hmm. But figure out a way to print it and get it out of there and in front of you. Executive function skills are crucial for success in school, work, and life. But for neurodivergent people, these skills can be particularly challenging. How can we make executive function more tangible and manageable? What strategies can help students and adults alike improve their time management, organization, and emotional regulation? We're exploring these questions with Carrie Bonnet, a veteran teacher and executive function coach. We talk about practical insights on empowering neurodivergent people and building resilience in the face of executive function difficulties. That's straight ahead on episode 244. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. I don't want you to forget that the doors to the Educator Hub close on Friday, October 4th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific, and they won't open again this year. The Educator Hub is growing with more members and more facilitators. My co-author, Amanda Morin, for our upcoming book, Neurodiversity Affirming Schools, is joining me in the Hub to offer more roundtables, office hours, and expertise. If you want to learn more and check out all of the offerings in the Educator Hub, head on over to neurodiversity.university or click the link in the show notes. Okay, Carrie is with me in a minute. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Let's imagine you've got three kids on a playground who are talking to each other. And this kid with auditory challenges is having a real hard time getting their words in at the right moment of social timing because it's taking them just a little bit longer to be ready to respond. And at that moment, now they have this sort of difficult choice. It's kind of a Sophie's choice, like neither choice is a great choice. They can either still say what they were going to say, but it's at the wrong moment of social timing and now they're labeled impulsive, a little overbearing, and they're talking over somebody. Or they say, no, that wasn't the right moment. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. And so they hang back and now they're starting to withdraw. But either way, it's not socially productive, right? And so sometimes these social challenges that we see might actually be rooted in an auditory challenge. It's pretty fascinating. That's episode 234. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Today, I'm welcoming Carrie Bonnet to the podcast. Carrie is a veteran teacher and executive function coach. Carrie, thank you so much for being here. Hello. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. To start off our conversation, I just kind of want to start with some of the basics and talk a little bit about executive functioning. So for anyone who's coming in, and I think it's always good, even if you know, to hear it from somebody else, but what is executive functioning and why is it such an important piece academically and in other areas of life? The simple definition that I like to use for executive function is just they are the brain skills, cognitive skills that help us get important things done. I used to just say to get things done, but now I like to insert that word important in there because I think in answer to your second question, why are they so important is because life requires us to do things that must be done on time or that they are important either to ourselves or to somebody else. And so I like to describe them as just all these skills that it takes to get important things done. Um, And yes, as a student academically, it's, I think, maybe the most important thing about being a student is being able to get things done even when we don't want to. Um, IQ and, you know, how smart you are, all that stuff, it matters, but, but you have to be able to to get your things done. Um, and then you and I both know they're not just school skills, they're life skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, getting things done is a lifetime endeavor. Well, it's funny that you insert that word important. So it's like how you get important things done because there are people who struggle with executive functioning who can get lots of unimportant things done. Mm -hmm. I know I'm one of those people, (laughs) Uh but it's like, how do you prioritize the things that are 
um, you know, the most important and, and try to initiate those tasks, you know, get them rolling along. What was it about this particular aspect that made you want to work with people who, who are struggling with this? Like, what was it that was like, you're like, oh my gosh, this is an area of real need and I know that I can help people. The truth is it was a friend of mine who, so I, I'll back up a little bit. I'm, I was a classroom teacher. So I come to this work from the teacher angle. Um, I taught middle and high school for 14 years, took some time off when my kids were young and was trying to figure out like what's next. And I was chatting with a school psychologist friend of mine and like, do I go back to teaching full time or kind of what? And this was probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And she said, you know what I think you should do? <laughs> mm-hmm. I think you should be an executive function coach. And I said, what's that? Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I had just turned 50 and in my teacher training, which was, you can imagine how many years ago, this executive function thing didn't exist in teacher training programs. And so I had no idea what that even meant. But when the more I started talking to my friend, uh, she said, the need is great. I can think of a dozen families I could refer to you right this minute. <laughs> and then it just kept kind of like nudging me. So I didn't do anything right away. Um, and then COVID. <laughs> and then I was talking to so many parents around really during COVID school, parents who said, gosh, you know, I thought my kids were doing okay until I had to sit right next to them while they were doing school. And I was realizing that they weren't really doing okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so sort of the, the start of it was my friend and then the nudging during COVID. And then now today, I just think it's, it's, maybe more so maybe important than during COVID, but, but I just want everybody to know what this thing is, that it's a real thing, right? Executive function is a real challenge for a lot of people. Yeah. And it has such an impact. I'm wondering, especially when we're talking about neurodivergent clients and granted, anybody might need some support with executive functioning, but I think in general, a lot of our neurodivergent people in our lives have more of those struggles perhaps than others. And so what would you say are some of the most common challenges that you really encounter with people with an ADHD diagnosis or an autism diagnosis as far as executive functioning skills? I mostly work with students, I should say. Mm -hmm. I do have some adult clients, actually more adult clients than I thought I would when I started this coaching practice. But primarily, I work with students. That's my, my background is with students. Most of the time, any client, neurodivergent or not, that comes to me, sort of the biggies are... Planning is a is a nightmare. <laughs> um, making like a big project is always always at the last minute. Always super stressful. Um, never can kind of chunk it in little bits. Um, so the planning piece comes up a lot. Um, time management comes up a lot, mostly because they're students, right? Like the planning, the time management, kind of organizing their their things, their their digital files, or their actual binder, or keeping track of dates and those types of things. So I would say overall. I mean, sure, things like like impulse control and emotional control and and focus comes up a lot. And I hear from parents first, typically. So the parents are telling me the projects are really hard. Keeping track of time is really hard. Keeping track of stuff is really hard. So those are probably the first ones that come to mind. Yeah. I have had conversations with different professionals in this field and Sometimes, depending on who you ask or who you talk to, some people will say, well, executive functioning skills, because it's kind of this neurodevelopmental aspect and it's all related to that prefrontal cortex and it's the last part of the brain to develop. It's like you can't really teach those skills. I look at them as skills. And I do think sometimes, especially with neurodivergent people, we're often trying to build the structures or almost like the hacks Mm. around it. I don't want people to come away with anything thinking like, oh, well, there's no possible way of finding success until somebody's brain is fully developed and, you know, all of those things. Because for what's worth, neurodivergent people always need some sort of, you know, support in that way. But what are your thoughts in that regard? That's so interesting. To some extent, you're, you're right about what you're saying is that in, in order to teach them, we're teaching workarounds. We're teaching, um, I like the hack word, that's real, mm-hmm. of the of the moment. Um, in my work, I look at it as like, part education and part strategies. So making sure that that a person understands kind of how their brain works, but it is a workaround, right? Like a mm-hmm. sort of, I still have to get my 
taxes filed on time. So I have to figure out a way. I, I recognize about my brain that X, Y, and Z are challenging, but here are some sort of workarounds or, or external support strategies almost, right? Like, I don't think that's a negative thing necessarily, but I can see where people who struggle with this stuff might start to feel like, Ugh, another thing I have to mm-hmm. figure out differently or fit into this box. Um, I can see where it would be, you know, emotionally challenging too, Mm -hmm. but it is, it it is, it is figuring out ways to work with the brain that you have. One of my phrases that I like to use is about working with somebody's brain instead of against it. Mm -hmm. Like recognizing that the tried and true strategies that are out there, probably by the time somebody's really struggling with executive functioning, they've probably tried those things. (laughs) They've probably been exposed to them. They've probably Mm -hmm. given it a shot. And for whatever reason, it's not sticking. Um, And so, you know, what is the way to handle that so that they are working in a way that is strengths-based, that's building on this? You know, so for a lot of people, you have a motivation to do a thing and your brain kind of lights up with a little reward. When you get it done, you check off that box and it's like, okay. And, and, that anticipation of that reward is the motivation. Like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and then I'm going to feel good when it's done. And I know sometimes for a lot of neurodivergent people, especially I think at ADHDers, it's almost sometimes reversed. Like that motivation doesn't come first. Mm-mm. You almost have to like get started on the thing, first of all, and you get a little momentum going. It's like, oh, and then you can kind of keep going. But it's kind of this backwards way of, of building that. Um, do, you, do you see that with your clients too? We I, we do. We sometimes feel like we must get motivated in order to, like, start the thing, whatever the mm-hmm. the boring or non preferred task. Um, but yeah, that's what I understand about brains is that neurodivergent or not, but especially is is we have to start first and then the motivation comes. Um, sometimes, not always, right? Like sometimes, even after we've started and uh, set a very short timer, which is a simple strategy to use. Um, Sometimes it's okay to give yourself permission to stop if the motivation didn't come, mm. but sometimes it does. You asked me at the beginning, like, what are what are the I don't know the biggies that I see in my practice that are a real challenge for people? Mm-hmm. And getting started is a biggie for sure. Uh, it's one that I struggle with. If I'm not excited about the thing, who wants to do it? Who wants to do something that's unpleasant? I mean, totally. Yeah, some people I think are driven by anxiety, like I have to get this thing done so that I'm not worried about it. Yep, I'm very good at ignoring that anxiety. <laughs> And then the deadline's there, and so you have to get it done. Right. You know, it's interesting. I was I was actually talking with a client earlier this week, and they were talking about they were having a difficult day as far as their mood goes for a couple of days. Um, and one of their strategies that they use, they're, they're college age, but they will actually, and I didn't know this, we'd never talked about it, but they will actually get in their car, drive to school, and then once they get there, they allow themselves to make the decision, okay, can I do this or can I not? And I thought that that was really smart. I mean, if we had brainstormed it, I thought that was a really good idea because they said basically, you know, most of the time they're like, well, I'm already here. Yep. Might as well get out of the car and walk in. It's only an hour, whatever it is. Yeah. Having that opportunity, though, to give yourself that permission to stop is really empowering. And so most recently when this person was dealing with this mood stuff that was going on, they drove to school and they're like, nope, I'm not going to do it. But at least it was that try, you know, and and to give yourself that opportunity to see, okay, my mood might shift or I might get that motivation or whatever it is. I was really proud of this particular client because that's a great skill to use. And it's, it's totally related to what we're talking about here, right? Like just, just start. And for her, for them, it meant just get to school. I love that. I love that. And, and like I said, giving yourself permission to say "Mm, no. Right. And I think that that's sometimes... The all or nothing thinking that goes along with some of it is so counterproductive because we get so stuck. If I'm not successful, then I'm a failure. And sometimes it's easier to not try and be a failure than to try. Yep. And having that halfway point, that it's like a checkpoint on a video game. Mm-hmm, that's right. It's like, oh, I don't have to play the whole level. I'm just going to get to the checkpoint. And then if I want to stop, I can stop. Chapters of a book or parts of a movie or whatever. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And you mentioned anxiety and anxiety comes up a lot in my work with my the students that I work with um whether diagnosed or not but but yeah like just being able to to not have to do it all mm-hmm. which to be honest is a strategy that I teach in my practice which is you know baby steps like don't 
don't have to do it all at once. Like I mentioned those big projects that that parents are panicked that their students hadn't started on. And students are panicked too. But that's, I don't ever want you to really work on a whole big project all at once anyway. Mm-hmm. So chunking in the executive function world, this term chunking, which just means little baby steps, little by little. Yeah, it's that's part of it too. Like I want you to take breaks. I want you to work on this little by little. I've heard you talk about this concept of making the invisible visible. Talk a little bit about that concept and, and can you share some examples of how that can help people who struggle with executive functioning? It's a big, like it's one of my big themes, <laughs> pillars of my of my coaching is um, I learned the, the terminology from um, Susan Kruger of Soar Learning, but I've heard it referred to as, you know, out of sight, out of mind, which we all know this saying for that student school was out of sight when they were home. So like just driving to see, you know, school was probably another reason why that strategy is a great one. Mm. Um, The reason I talk about making the invisible visible is there is so much in our world, in our lives that is invisible. And that is a challenge, especially so for neurodivergent folks. So I'm talking about time. Time is invisible. Time is also weird if we're going to be on <laughs> um, chores, expectations, homework, especially now that everything's on the iPad, you know, everything gets closed into the laptop or the iPad and put in the backpack. It is invisible. Mm-hmm. The backpack makes things invisible. Um, and so what I mean by making the invisible visible is whenever possible, trying to keep things in sight to support brains. So, I mean, I talk to my student clients about this for sure. Parents, yes. Adult clients, yes. Teachers in the classroom, yes. Keeping things visible is just one, like, I want to say simple way of of helping support brains. Um, But part of it is also recognizing what needs to be visible. Like, oh, you know, I'm working on, let's, I keep coming back to this big project, this fake project that I've created in my head. Um, But the instructions you know, should be something visible. So not all teachers print instructions for students anymore, Mm. but I think that's pretty critical. So I tell all my students that I work with, you have to print the instructions. Even if this teacher did not make it quite so easy, you know, it's not a PDF, maybe it's just literally text inside of a Google Classroom or something, Mm -hmm. but figure out a way to print it and get it out of there and in front of you. So you can write all over it mm-hmm. and keeping clocks, you know, Emily knows how I feel about clocks. <laughs> um, analog clocks are keeping those in your face kind of all the time. Yeah. I mean, that might be ambitious, but, but then you, you know, the passing of time is more visible. I'm a mom. I have a ninth grader and a sixth grader and we have sort of their afternoon expectations. They come home from school. Um, their dad and I are working, but like X, Y, and Z needs to happen each afternoon. And those are on a whiteboard in our kitchen, in their face. Mm-hmm. I, I think it can't be overstated, really. And especially like if if we recognize that we're struggling, ooh, which is a skill in and of itself, like oh, I'm getting distracted <laughs> or I'm not focusing on the right task right now. One way to do it is to just write it down. Mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned um, people have tried lots of these things. I'm sure a to-do list <laughs> or a checklist is something that everybody, not everybody, but lots of people have said, could say that they tried, Mm -hmm. but all to-do lists are not created equal. And one of those things is it has to be in sight in your face. The idea of printing the thing out, I think is excellent. And I think for people who are maybe seeking accommodations for their, for their child or for a student, that might be an appropriate accommodation. Yes. Because I know for me, I'm sorry to the earth and I recycle the pages when I'm done, but I do print them out. That is much easier for me uh-huh. than having to go and look and like try to pull up an email or pull up whatever. I can have everything there. I've talked about it before on the podcast, but my husband always teases me because I've got my paper planner. But part of it is about having everything all there together and I can shuffle through it and look at and I can see everything. Even if I have just one list on my phone or whatever, having to scroll through to look for it is harder for me to really get a good sense of what it is I have to do. And so, you know, again, having that tangible piece of paper that you're holding in your hand um, and then crossing things off as you go, whatever that might be, yep. if that's a task or instructions from a teacher, I think that that can be really um, 
really helpful yeah. in a lot of ways. And and it's a simple thing. I, I think the other piece, I do a lot of this with my clients sometimes at the office, breaking it down into steps, but like putting it either on post-it notes or index cards, but just putting one item per Again, it kind of, first of all, makes those tasks feel more manageable because they're just one thing at a time. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of, I'm thinking of teachers in the classroom, other accommodations. That's a great one, is to separate them. The index card is a great idea, the sticky notes. Mm -hmm. Because our brains, their brains, students' brains, especially those who struggle with this stuff, can really only manage one at a time. Um, And it becomes overwhelming. So, you know, like I just said a minute ago that all lists are not created equal. Yeah, you you have to have very few things on your list, like make it achievable Mm -hmm. so that your brain doesn't look at it and go like, whatever, I can't, there's no way I'm going to be able to do. That's why I do love a brain dump, Mm -hmm. like get it out of your head onto paper, even a digital to-do app if you must. But that's not your working list. Like that is just get it out, offload it from my brain. And then the index card or the sticky note, I use a sticky note, Mm-hmm. or even in your plan or just like, but it has to be achievable. That motivation word comes up again, but <laughs> to be even slightly motivated to get started, one or two, maybe three things, but yeah. I want to talk just a little bit about emotional regulation because it's so closely tied to executive functioning. I mean, we've already talked a little bit about anxiety, which I think goes along with that quite a lot. Even though you might be focused on the executive function with your client's You're also helping build resilience and helping them to learn how to manage some of those emotions because they're so closely tied to frustration and overwhelm and all those different pieces. So can you talk a little bit about how you approach that with your clients? Yeah, I include it as one of the skills that we that we talk about. Mm. So you Google executive function and and you get different types of lists of of skills. <laughs> um, the one that I like to use comes from Peg Dawson and Richard Guare. They have Smart but Scattered, this series of books um, that maybe some of your listeners have heard of. I love them. But they include emotional control on their list of skills, executive function skills. So we I talk about it right up front. It goes kind of hand in hand with with impulse control, right? Like so. Um, impulsive behavior, but in this case, emotional behavior or emotions. The first thing that I say to my clients anyway, and that I would say to anybody wondering about it is that um, the way I understand it, that the best strategies for those two, the impulse control and the emotional control is, is uh, they're preemptive in nature. (laughs) Mm. Um, Meaning that it's smart to take a step back and maybe not in the moment, but to talk about exercise to figure out how the sleep situation is going. It's food, nutrition, right? Like food, exercise, sleep are huge Mm -hmm. when it comes to brains, when it comes to bodies, but also specifically when it comes to emotional control, impulse control. Um, But when I'm talking with parents, I also add in the like one-on-one connection. Mm. Have you had 10 minutes to just hang out with your kid doing something fun? Um, or enjoyable, something you both love. And so those four things, food, exercise, sleep, connection, Mm -hmm. that's where we start the conversation. Um, Unfortunately, you have to think back on it, right? Like once there's been an emotional um, blow up or or something challenging, then you think back on it. And hey, you know, I noticed that, gosh, I didn't eat lunch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or I noticed that, you know, I forgot you had a really terrible night's sleep last night. So those things I would say, first and foremost, um, are things that I like to talk about. But then we have to live our lives too, right? <laughs> um, and not be constantly thinking about, did I eat enough? Did I break a sweat? Did I, <laughs> how's my sleep? Um, and so that's where things like, you know, trying to ha- tr- manage transitions um, for kids. Mm-hmm. Transition times, I feel like are the often the biggie where maybe an outburst will will take place. So, I mean, I guess it comes down to really getting curious Maybe that's the theme of, of this comment of mine is, is getting curious, like, what is going on? What do I notice? What if they had a bad night's sleep? Or what if this is a skill thing? They just don't have the skill to manage the big emotion when it comes up. Mm-hmm. So, And then what if the transition that I was asking them to do was just too, too much something, too quick, uh, undesirable? <laughs> um, yeah. what, if, what if that's the case? So I guess the, the getting curious part is pretty key. I'm sure that by the time you work with a lot of your clients, because you primarily work with older students and adults. Middle school and up. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm sure that the messages that those people have received related to executive functioning, they probably have a lot of negative feelings about it or feelings like they can't do it or that they're having a hard time doing it. How do you help them overcome that piece of it? Yeah, kids, they get so much, not just kids, everybody gets so much negative feedback and Mm -hmm. messaging, like you said. Um, That's kind of why I was saying that, like, I see my work as part education and part strategies. Mm -hmm. Like, if if I only was just like, use a checklist, use an analog clock, here's a planner, you know, it doesn't. First of all, kids don't like that. <laughs> they don't like to be told what to do. Yeah. Um, I, I also don't like to be told what to do. So <laughs> it's true. Not just kids, but but the why behind it, you know? So mm-hmm. so that's why in our, we talk about brains so much um, in my work and understanding your unique brain and what your brain needs. I just feel like the education piece is, is huge, right? So to I tell my clients and anybody I talk to about executive function that the challenge is with time management or planning or focus or getting started are not a character flaw, right? You know, it's not a moral failing. Are they told this, that it is? Yeah, sure are. Mm -hmm. They often hear it. You, why are you so lazy? Why can't you? You should be able to. But part of the education on my end is the, really though? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. At least having some person in their life telling them that, that that's not really the case but it's real hard to hear that, I think, and believe it mm-hmm. when, when a student has been told all those years that whew, you are a mess. Yeah. Yeah. When you look back on your time in the classroom and you think about teachers today, are there any like things that you wish you had known, mm-hmm. things that you wish you had understood about executive functioning that might be helpful for people who are working in the classroom today? I think truly, I think what I just said would be really helpful Yeah. because I will tell you, I'll be very honest. And I, I've always been a relationship person, right? Mm-hmm. Like I creating relationships with students is the most important thing in my career still to this day. But I am very honest about the fact that I am sure that I was judging kids when I was in the classroom. Mm-hmm. I'd like to say like, oh, I've always had a heart for the kids who, you know, struggled in this way. I didn't. I didn't. I was saying, why can't you turn in your work on time? Mm-hmm. So I think that is the biggest is like that that mindset shift of if the student could do better, they would. Mm-hmm. And the what and the what if like what if turning in homework late all the time is a skill thing, mm-hmm. and what is the skill, and then work on teaching the skill. Um, so I yeah I mean I think that. That's the biggest is that mindset shift for for teachers. But then that invisible, visible thing you can use in the classroom too. I was just actually talking to my daughter's teacher from last year and he has been learning from me a little bit and he is trying this year to just make more things visible. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the agenda is on the board. Um, Make sure that some students might need their own little personal sticky note or a reminder of the one thing that we're working on or the two things that we're working on. Um, certainly making sure to teach time telling on a, on an analog clock. I ask every person I work with, how comfortable do you feel telling time on an analog clock? Adults too. Yeah. And a lot of them say, "Mm, not so comfortable. Uh So just that, you know, like, so that making the invisible visible piece in the classroom is super important. Honestly, I think the mindset shift and the, and some of these sort of strategies to keep things in sight the biggies right now in my mind. Well, Carrie, this has been such a great conversation. Brings me to our last question as we kind of wrap up today. So just thinking about, you know, if you had a new client who you were working with, a student who is struggling with this executive functioning and they're coming in and they just really have this feeling of overwhelm and a lack of self-efficacy, what would you want to say to them? What's, What's the one thing that you would really want them to hear? I would want them to know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, I guarantee you a lot of students in your classroom also who are feeling the same way. Um, and that there are ways to make school and life easier, pretty simple ways. Um, but it's not a quick fix. So that's the unfortunate thing. I'm sorry to tell you student, fictional student that we're talking about (laughs) or any student that I work with that it's, it's a real kind of a process, but, um, 
but yeah, you're not alone and and you can you can learn these skills. Carrie Bonnet, thanks so much for being here today. I love talking about executive function with you, Emily. Thank you. One of the main keys to success as neurodivergent people is finding the life hacks that work for us. What are the workarounds and the tools that can help us manage the day-to-day that comes so naturally to others? It might seem discouraging that ADHDers, autistic people, and other neurodivergent folks have to rely on these quote-unquote cheat codes to get through life, but really, it makes sense. You know what they call the hacks that work for a majority of people? Strategies, or maybe skills. There's no stigma surrounding having a tool that helps you with accomplishing the tasks you need, unless it's different than what other people need. So let's work on eliminating that stigma and embracing what works for us without the shame or embarrassment of needing something different. It's all about finding what works. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. info about Carrie Bonnet and her work, you can find links in the show notes. Also, as we draw closer to the holidays, I hate to say it too loud because we're not in any big hurry, are we? If you're thinking about gift ideas, though, check out our swag. It's all right there on our website, neurodiversitypodcast.com. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our music is from Epidemic Sound. Find us on social media via links in the show notes and on our website. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.